right, guys, we're back. Chapter three. Make sure your cameras are on. Waiting for you guys so I can start. Cameras, cameras on, let's go. All right, and you gotta make sure the cameras are, are facing you, very, very important. Now, chapter three is only nine pages, so it's a short chapter. Some of the stuff we already covered, we're gonna be more focused on uh, different types of uh, estates, so freehold or leasehold, right? Um, to be simple, we're gonna repeat this in, in a little bit, be simple if it says freehold usually it's talking about ownership okay if it says leasehold it's talking about tenants simple but every time you see freehold it's talking about some type of ownership in the property while leasehold is tenancy so you're you're there for a period of time okay ownership freehold tenants or leases leasehold so we're going to start with interest and in states estates in land now again i like to ask questions so my first question is we already know what an estate means, so asset, right? Something we own, so assets, that's estate, we got it. What about interest? What is an interest in somebody's property or in your property? What is an interest? We're not talking about interest like mortgages, financial interest, we're talking about interest in a property. What does that mean? interest in a property value okay the word interest we got value what else interest so there's a state which is ownership right and then there's interest capital okay so if you put money, it's called equitable interest. Yes, there's capital into it. Okay. Who else? Rights. Correct, Riley. Thank you. You have rights in the property. Absolutely. So interest, rights. Let's see what else. We have interest in something. What does that mean? Interest in something. Learning. Okay. What else? Why would you, let me ask in a different way. Why would you have an interest in something? Because you expect something to come out of it, right? You expect to have some kind of, kind of, starts with a B. Gain, okay. That's right. Perfect. All right. Some kind of profit, some kind of. Starts with a B, B as in boy. I kind of say who we're putting in the safe. Benefit, yes. So that's what it is, guys. So rights, I'm sorry, interest. Interest is a set of rights. and <clears throat> benefits so let me go back to this hold on a second in the example that i gave on the 
hundred unit next to the ten unit, we purchased we purchased the air rights above the ten unit. That means we have an interest in somebody else's property. Interest means we have certain rights or certain controls over somebody else's property. Does that make sense? So when we talk about interest means asset, and then I'm sorry, estate means assets. When we talk about interest, it's rights and benefits in a property. Okay. Rights and benefits in a property. So in this case, because it says in land, it's in a real property or um, land as raw land. Okay. So we already talked about this bundle of rights that you might have. All right. We already talked about the bundle of rights, the right to possess, the right to use, the right to transfer, the right to encumber, which means you're putting a mortgage on the property and the right to exclude people that you don't want in your property. It is your property, right? Now, uh, an undivided interest, undivided as it says, there's no division of it, is an owner's interest in a property in which two or more parties share ownership. The term undivided and indivisible signify that the owner's interest is in a fractional part of the entire estate not a physical portion so for instance if we have a three family three family building but there's two owners how are we going to divide this physically it's a little tough right so that means that our interest is a shared interest undivided or indivisible there's no way to separate so the only way for me to get rid of you or you to get rid of me is to sell the building, right? And we split our profits 50-50, whatever our agreement is. There's no way to physically say, hey, I keep two floors, you keep one. You understand? So that's an indivisible or undivided interest. Examples of interests... Yeah, there could be a buyout, but if I don't accept the buyout, you can force me. We're going to go over this too. You can force me into what's called a judicial partition. That means you can force me in court to sell the building in order to separate uh, the assets. So yes, the typical scenario would be, hey, listen, not working out, Lula. I, I love you, but this business is not working out, so I need to be out, right? So... I want X amount of dollars. And Lula, you're going to go like, no, no way. Bruno, you're out of your mind. So we're still married for the next, and I'm sorry, don't get offended. Uh, I don't, by the way, guys, I, I get to everybody. I get married. I get divorced. I kill you guys. I never die, but I resurrect you right after for the next example. Just letting you know. So in this case, uh, <laughs> like I said, as partners, we're still married, right? And... I still need to get rid of the property of, of, because I need the money. And you're still saying, no way. I'm not buying you out for that amount of dollars. So what's my next step? I have to sue you. I can try to sell to somebody, but nobody's going to give me that money either. So I'm going to sue you in court to say, hey, uh, it's like a divorce almost, right? But a partnership divorce. I'm going to sue you in court to say, hey, listen, it's not, it, it's not working out, Your Honor, and we have to do something. If possible, and we're going to repeat this again later on, if possible, what we're going to do is um, we're going to split the property physically and say, hey, this is your side, this is my side, right? If it's, a, if it's for instance, a, um, a duplex, it's easy. If there's two people, it's a duplex, perfect. You're half my half, right? But if not, then if there's no way, like the three family, if there's no way to separate, then um, the judge will order the property to be sold and then we split the, the profits accordingly. That's a judicial partition or judicial separation of the assets. Okay. Do I have the right to sell my interest? Yeah, to whoever wants, is willing to buy for the price that I want. Yeah. You just said like a divorce. I don't, th I don't think we can sell our half to somebody else in a divorce. Like, hey, here's my wife. I'm selling her to you. Take her, please. No. Um, I understand. Out of context. Yeah. You're replying to something else. I got it. I, guys, I, I'm not crazy. I just want to show you again. 
Do you have the right to sell your interest to someone else, like a divorce? In a marriage, what's our interest? It's the wife. The divorce is, I'm not interested anymore. Sold. <laughs> or vice versa. I mean, you could sell me. You never, you never know. Right? Um, anyway, I don't know which one of us would lose more. Just saying. Now, <laughs> right here, what interest, what could it include? Uh, it could include um, an owner who enjoys the complete bundle of rights, a tenant who temporarily enjoys the rights to use and exclude, so they have an interest in the property through the lease, right? A lender who enjoys the right to encumber the property over the life of a mortgage lien. See, the bank does not own the property. They don't have a freehold ownership, right? But they have the interest in the property that if you don't pay, they can go to court and take the property away from you, right? So they have a, a, a temporary right over the property. A repairman did some work and you did not pay for them for, for the work. So they can sue you for damages. So they can also uh, have the rights to do that on your property. A buyer who prevents an owner from selling the property to another party under the terms of a sales contract. Um, a mining company who temporarily owns the rights to extract the minerals from the property subsurface, as we mentioned in the previous chapter. A local municipality has the right to control an owner's uses of the property, what he can and cannot do with it. So a municipality will say, hey, this is a residential area, for example. Can you build a, a, a business on it? Can you put a, a shopping center on it? Well, if it's residential area, then they control what you can do with it. Only residential, right? Or a utility company, which claims access to the property in accordance to an easement. We're going to talk about these terms later on. But the utility company can come into your property to fix something. Water, sewer, electricity. They can just come there. They have their rights. Okay, so these are interests which are benefits or rights in someone's property. I'm sorry, so that, that was, I'm sorry. That was uh, the examples of interest. And what's the difference between um, interest and rights? In an interest... There's a time frame of how long I may enjoy the interest. What portion of the land, the air, or subsurface the interest applies to? Is it everything? Is it just a, a, a single step over there? Is it uh, the whole depthness of the house, but not the whole length of the house? But, I mean, the whole width of the house? What is it? Uh, whether it's a public interest or a private interest, and whether it includes legal ownership of the property or not. These are the different types of interests that we have in real estate. Possession. Possession creates a state. A state creates ownership, right? Or asset. A state creates assets. So there's two different types of estates that allow you possession. There's freehold estate and there's leasehold estate, right? So as a tenant, the, the unit is my asset for a certain period of time so I can take possession I can use it I can exclude people right I just cannot transfer that asset to anybody else can I sell as a tenant can I sell the property no that's why it's called leasehold and not freehold so you have a limited uh, ownership or rights to the property non-possession interests non-possession I don't have immediate possession of the property, but I could gain possession of the property somehow or temporary possession of the property somehow through an encumbrance like mortgages, construction liens, tax lien, anything that's money, for instance, will be under encumbrance. A shared driveway will be under encumbrance, right? Um, let's say... Uh, I'll allow you to park your car in my driveway, even though you're just a tenant, right? It creates an encumbrance because I give you a license. I give you permission to do so. So when I sell the property and I sell the property, I say, hey, in the lease, I included the, the parking in the driveway. And the buyer say, well, then it's not worth the same. If I cannot take possession of the driveway, then it's not worth the same. So it encumbers or clouds the title. I'm going to explain this word better in a second, right? And then public interest is pretty much how it can uh, affect the general uh, public and how they control you by not allowing as a community for certain things to happen. Okay, 
So let's go over this real quick. An encumbrance, where it says encumbrance, I want you to write cloud. Cloud. By the way, it's the only word that I can write clearly on this whiteboard. Can you guys get it? It's C L O U D. Cloud. It's the only word. Other than that, I suck at this. <laughs> I can voice it, but I suck at writing. So, cloud. What is a cloud? Look, we're in the perfect time for clouds. We see clouds all the time now. How do you guys feel? Like emotionally, physically, how do you guys feel today versus about a month ago or a month and a half ago when it was summer, when it was hot, you could go to the beach, it was sunny outside, right? How do you guys feel? How does, how does it change physically, emotionally? How do you feel? And I'll tell you how this relates to real estate in a second. But let me know in the chat. How do you feel right now in wintertime versus, or autumn still, but in wintertime versus summertime? Sluggish. Tired. Well, Shanice, I got great products for you. Uh, <laughs> Shanice says, tired. Dormant. Denise sells some of these great products, by the way. And then she says, tired? That's no way to advertise. You should say, excited, because I'm covered. <laughs> anyway, so dormant. Yeah, your body changes, right? Your body changes with the seasons, right? If, if you're in summertime, if you're in spring, you usually feel like liberated, like, oh my God, we can go outside, we can do whatever we want, right? But then when it's raining, when it's cold, right? First of all, you got to put more clothes on, which is, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I hate, I hate, not that much, but I hate clothes. So I, I hate to be suffocated, right? So that's the first thing that goes wrong, right? So it starts affecting you. A cloud over you affects you somehow. You guys understand? So usually I say this because in, in real estate is the same thing. An encumbrance, and we guys are going to learn this by uh, later on when we talk about clouds on the title. Right? Cloud on the title. An encumbrance is a cloud. It's something that's attached to the property and it affects the value of the property. Just like a cloud over you, it's like, oh my God, okay, I don't have the same energy to do the same things I used to do a month ago, right? And then because it's winter, we tend to eat more and then we feel even more tired, right? All that good stuff. Especially, did you guys realize most of the, the holidays, like the good holidays, they put it in the middle of winter? Right? Did you guys realize that? Like on purpose. These people are going to shop more. They're going to gather more because they won't be outside, right? They're going to eat more, right? They're going to hibernate, right? It's unbelievable. But anyway, encumbrance, cloud on the title, is something that enables a non-owning party to restrict the owner's bundle of rights. So let me ask you, if you have a mortgage on your property, that you owe, let's say, you owe on that mortgage, you owe 500000 right? This is how much you owe on the property. But the property value, so the fair market value, is 480000 You owe more than what the property is worth. Can you sell the property right now? Today, can you sell the property? You can if you pay $20,000 to sell your own property. Do you understand? So that mortgage, that mortgage, that lien against your property created a cloud. The bank does not own the property. You do. But the property is worth less than what you owe to the bank, as an example. If, the, if this property, this $480,000 property, uh, you owe $14,000 in taxes, right? But your neighbor's property, which has pretty much the same value and it's for sale and your neighbor's property pays 11,000 in taxes. Which one would you buy? If they're pretty much the same value, pretty much the same house, I would go with the 11,000 versus the 14,000. Do you see what I'm saying? So certain things are attached to your property 
affect the value of your property or the rights to your property. If it's a shared driveway versus your own driveway, does it affect the value of your property? Sure, because your property is encumbered by a neighbor that owns part of your property somehow, right? So that's what we're talking about here. A cloud, again, encumbers, right, or affects the value. So tax liens, mortgages, easements, and encroachments are examples of encumbrances. There's anything you guys have questions on, please feel free to ask, okay? Now, an estate in land. This is simple. I'm going to skip right through. You already know estate means asset, in land means real property, right? So you own a land or you own real property. That's what it's called. Estates in land could be freehold. I already addressed that before. Or leasehold. Freehold, freehold, ownership. I already covered this earlier. So again, ownership. So you can own the property for a lifetime or forever. So as long as you're alive or forever. Okay? Leasehold, there's a term. So leasehold, there's a term. So if there's a term, there's a specific duration. So you are a tenant. Again, tenant. You're there for a particular piece of time, not for a very long time, not forever, okay? So you are a tenant, all right? Now, I need to address this because uh, it'll, be, uh, uh, it'll be messy in, an, in, an, in a few pages or even a few chapters when we go back to this, right? Both leasehold and freehold are referred to as tenancies because tenancy means occupancy okay so there's a freehold tenancy and there's a leasehold tenancy freehold tenancy and leasehold tenancy who occupies or who has the rights to occupy the property that's the question if it's through a lease you are a leasehold tenant the thing is that the majority of the times what do we do we call tenants tenants and owners owners right that's what we do we do that separation but technically we are all tenants the difference is whether you are a renter or a lessee so renters and lessees right are leasehold tenants while owners are freehold tenants or occupants right now, under, <clears throat> under freehold estates, I already addressed that freehold means ownership. There's different types of ownership as well. There's the fee simple estate. And as the word says, simple. You are the owner, period. Nobody can take it away from you. You are the owner. It's simple, absolute ownership. There's a life estate, and the life estate means you are the owner of the property as long as you're alive. So I'll explain that better in a second. So life estate is based on your life or based on somebody else's life. So you own it for a certain period of time. What is that period of time? Well, until that person dies or you die, whoever was the, the valued life against this property. Vodka? Denise just wrote vodka. Did I say vodka somewhere? Or is somebody drinking? Oh, no. Okay, you're thinking about this. Uh, so, no. <laughs> Gotta pay attention to you. Jeez. So, um, it's not vodka. No, it's vodder. So, it's... it's uh, <laughs> It's similar, just no alcohol uh, yet. Uh, I can't promise anything after uh, the class, but for now is water. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I'll probably do that, Shanice. I'll do that. 
for the next class, I'll bring a, a bottle of vodka, fill it with water, see what people say. I'm pretty sure on YouTube it will steer a movement. Be like, oh my god, did you see the, the drunken instructor? <laughs> That'll be my new name. All right, so uh, life estate is based on somebody's life. And there's two different types of life estates. There's a conventional and legal life estate. Let me explain that better in a second. So freehold estates, they differ primarily according to the duration of the estate and what happens to the estate when the owner dies. A freehold estate of potential unlimited duration is a fee simple estate and an estate limited to the life of the owner is a life estate, as I just said. A fee simple estate, again, it's simple, it's yours, it's the highest form of ownership. Fee simple is the highest form of ownership, like supreme power, it's yours, okay? Within fee simple, there's two different types. There's a fee simple absolute and the fee simple defeasible. Now, defeasible means there's some type of condition. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Bruno, how can fee simple be the supreme form of ownership if there could be conditions? Well, as long as you never break that condition, the property is yours. See, a tenant, as an example, a tenant is there for that period of time, period. That's it, right? So you know that it's going to end regardless. A life estate, as we're going to talk about later, is based on somebody's life. So you know that that person is going to die eventually. A fee simple is the terminal based on the usage, for instance, of the property. So you can only lose it if you change the usage. Does that make sense? So the other two, they're, they're, you're definitely eventually going to end. Here, it might last forever as long as that condition does not change. Thumbs up on that? All right, cool. So fee simple, absolute, no strings attached, it's perpetual. You can pass it down to your heirs if you want, perpetual. There's no conditions forever. Fee simple, defeasible, defeasible, that means you can be defeated, you could lose, right? That's what, that's what I like to, Compare it to the feasible, you can be defeated, so you can lose. So there's a condition to it. So the essential characteristics are that the property must be used for a certain purpose or under a certain condition. And if the use changes or if prohibited conditions are present, the estate reverts to the previous grantor of the estate. The two forms of fee simple defeasible are determinable or condition subsequent. So, I want you to write in front of this, again, conditional, or contingent. Because what is a contingency? Again, it's a condition. It's yours as long as this happens, conditional or contingency, right? So, again, the property is yours as long as you do not violate certain restrictions. So, can I sell the property to you? Ed, I'm going to sell it to you. I'm going to, sell the, I'm going to sell the property to you as long as you keep it, right? As long as you keep it as hospital usage, right? So, Ed, you just purchased the property. But you know that the only thing you can do with the property is use it as hospital uh, for hospital purposes. As an example, the moment Ed goes like, well, the hospital business is not giving anything. We're going to close down and turn this into, um, I don't know, office spaces. So it'll be commercial office spaces. The moment, Ed, you change that, that's it. You lose the property, it reverts back to me. So that's the the termination and the condition that we put there. So if, if the condition is violated, the previous owner may repossess the property. That's what we're saying. I can give you the property, for instance. 
the example we had in the Dearborn Edition book was um, I could give you the property for you to use it as wildlife preserve, meaning it has to stay as wildlife. And then the, the person that acquired the property, so in this case, Ed, decided to build a corporate headquarters on it. Now, a building is not wildlife. The people that will be there might be animals, but they're not the same type of animals. They're not wild animals. So it does affect what I intention, what was my intention when I sold to you. You guys understand? So the fact that you violated those conditions, that's it. Property reverts back to me. So I have some type of reversionary interest. Do you get your money back? Uh, you wish. You violated the terms. Why should I give you any money back? You lose, not me. I sold it to you with this condition. You breached the contract. Give me the property back. All right? Now, life estate, though, life estate, as the name says, is based on somebody's life. So, upon the death of the owner or the named individual, the estate passes to the original owner or the named party. So, what we're saying is, who am I going to kill? Riley. What's up? Sorry. So here's the thing. I'm going to sell the property to Riley as long as she's alive. Right? If Riley dies tomorrow, right? Knock on wood. If Riley dies tomorrow, the property reverts automatically back to me. Because I sold it to her as long as she's alive. Okay? Now, can Riley say, you know what? I was thinking about this. I'm going to sell the property. So I'm going to sell the property to Arlene, right? And Riley gives the property to, Ar to Arlene, Arlene, right? Did, did uh, Arlene get rid of the condition because you sold it to her? No. See, now Arlene is buying the property as long as Riley's alive. So when Riley dies, Arlene, guess what happens? You can say bye-bye to the property because it comes back to me. All right. So in all of these determinable conditions, all in all of these, the owner enjoys full ownership rights during the estate period. So you can do whatever you want. The condition is in the previous example, you got to keep it as hospital or wildlife or whatever. And in this example, well, as long as they're alive, you can do whatever you want. You're entitled to all the uh, income that comes from the property. You're entitled to sell the property. You're entitled to gift the property. You can do whatever you want. Except, in this case, except pass it down to your heirs. Because it ends with your death. So your heirs can never inherit this property. Now, me. I'm the holder of a future interest. I do not own the property, but I have an interest in the property I sold to you. What is that interest called? It's called a reversionary interest. Reversionary interest because it might revert back to me. It could also be called a remainder interest if I say, you know what, Riley? I'm going to sell the property to you for as long as you're alive. But when you die, instead of coming back to me, I want it to go to uh, Denise. All right? So here's what happens. Denise is a third party. So she's called a remainder. And we're going to go in detail. But Denise is a third party. I'm the first party, and so is Riley. Okay? Denise is a third party. She's not part of the purchase and sale agreement. She's just somebody else that I named as the receiver of the benefit if or when Riley dies, or if or when Ed violates the agreement. You guys understand? So these are conditional. I'll explain that in a second. Let me just, just finish this. But I saw, I saw your questions, uh, Lula and Riley. Okay. But let's talk about remainder again. Who's the remainder man? The remainder man is a third party that will receive the title upon termination of the life estate. It's the same thing to feed eternal. Because I can say, hey, Ed, I'm going to sell to you as long as you keep it as a hospital. But then if Ed does not keep it as a hospital, he changes the terms of the, the contract, what am I going to say? Well, in the contract, when I sold to you, 
if you violated the terms of it, it would go to Francesca. So Francesca is now the remainderman. A third party is always called a remainderman, whoever remains from the deal, but it was not initially part of the deal. Okay, so me and you, Ed, or me and you, Riley, we were first party, second party, right? Direct to the contract. In this scenario, Francesca is a third party. She was not a seller, she was not a buyer, she's just someone receiving the benefit if one of you violates the terms or, in the case of Riley, concludes the term, right? Remainderman, always third party. That's called the remainder interest. Reversion, as it says, it reverts. So I have a reversionary interest if the property comes back to me. I sell to you, but if you screw up or if you decide to die too soon, it comes back to me, right? Reversionary interest. There's two types of life estates, conventional, legal. Conventional, legal, okay? In a conventional life estate is determined by me selling to you and saying, hey, ordinary is based on your life, Riley, okay? That's an ordinary life estate or conventional life estate. Pour autre vie means somebody else's life. So I sold to Riley, right, for as long as Joel is alive. So the property is yours, Riley. I'm selling it to you directly as long as he's alive. When he dies, you lose your property. So that's a pour autre vie, someone else's life. Then there's the traditional legal life estate, which is based on husband and wife. So that's the homestead. That's the, hey, if I die, wife, you get 50% of what I own in this property, right? If you die, I get your 50%. So that's the legal life estate based on the marriage, based on the homestead, based on the marital residence. We attribute what's yours and what's mine 50-50 and upon each other's death, one or the other acquires the other side. So that's the legal, it, it happens automatically. Here, conventional is I sold to you with a condition here is, we got married, you know the conditions, period. Okay? Uh, Riley, before I address that question, you know I never die, so I don't even know why you're asking that question. Like, I, I don't even know why it even pops up here. Like, what happens if you die? You know how long I've been on this earth? Crazy. Anyway, I will address your questions in a second. All right, so I just explained this. The fact that you have ordinary, right, and pour autre vie, somebody else's life, ordinary life estate, and I want to get to the legal, right, so homestead, dower and courtesy, and elective share. Now, these are created, I'm sorry, these are created by state law as opposed to being created by a uh, property owner's agreement. So from here on, it's the common sense that everybody knows. Before this is what you guys were asking and I'll address it right now. So for instance, you get your money back, I already addressed that one, right? The question here is, who would do something like this, right? You even sounded like, oh my God, who would do something like this? Right, that was so bad, destroyed it. Who would do something like this and why? Uh, so, usually, us normal people, commoners, that didn't have any type of uh, education, like financial education in college or, or in, the, in high school or regular schools, whatever, we were not born into uh, a golden um, uh, empire, right? Usually, we do not know this stuff. So, who would do something like this? Most people that do this, they understand property preservation or estate preservation. Just think about it. So I'll address what's the gain for a seller and then the gain for a buyer, right? So I'll address both uh, in here as well. Who would gain from this? Think about it. If I sell to you, like let's say in the example of Riley, if I sell to Riley, now Riley, you're young, 
So I expect you to live forever, right? So because I expect you to live forever, I know that eventually you will die. One day you will. Like that's, that's guaranteed for all of us. But I know that while you had it, while you had the property, I did not have to maintain the property. I did not have to pay taxes on the property. I also did not reap the benefits of the property. The only benefit I have right here, the only benefit I have is that 20 years, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, whatever time you live, it's almost guaranteed that the property value is going to increase, right? So what happens if I die? The property comes back to, to me, and if I'm not alive, it goes to my heirs. So remember when I said the state preservation? If I sell all my properties with this condition, then eventually they all come back to me, and I become very wealthy. If I don't, my heirs will. So for the seller, for the seller, the benefit is I don't have to pay taxes because it's not my asset. I don't have to maintain it because it's not my asset. Uh, I don't have to to be responsible and have insurance because it's not my asset, right? And later on, it comes back to us. So it's a win-win situation for me. For you as a buyer, like why would somebody gain for being an owner of such a thing? Well, traditionally, just like condos, they're like the cheapest form. Condos and co-ops are the cheapest form of ownership, but you have some restrictions. It's not like a single family where it's, you can do whatever you want, right? Condos come with restrictions. So I use this as the same comparison. You own a property for a cheaper value, right? But some restrictions. Uh, is this similar to an HOA? So no. When I talked about condos is because, yeah, you're, you're somewhat controlled by an HOA. But in this case, you're controlled by an HOA while you're the owner. In, in the fee determinable or the fee defeasible or life estate, you're not controlled by anything. You can do whatever you want. The only condition you have is that don't die or Ed, don't change the hospital into something else. That's the only condition. You're entitled to all the income. You can do whatever you want with the property. I don't care. Just don't destroy the property, right? So you can do anything. Once you die, it comes back to me. So what would you gain as a buyer? Yeah, please. Work on not dying. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> listen, you, you can always go Walt Disney, right? Frozen, last forever. There you go. Hopefully one day they'll figure out a way to revive you. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> um, what was the benefit as a buyer? Again, just like a condo, it's like you're buying something cheaper, right? You just know already up front, you know, there's some type of control, like an HOA controls you, right? There's some type of condition in this case, die or if you change the regulations of our contract, that's it. Okay, thumbs up. Okay, cool. All right. Dower and courtesy. Now, dower and courtesy. Sorry. Forgot to switch. Uh, dower and courtesy. I'm currently on page 36. Dower and courtesy. So dower and courtesy is, remember I said husband and wife, if one dies, the other one acquires the, the interest that belongs to that party. That's what dower and courtesy is. So dower is the benefit that the wife has, while courtesy is the benefit that the husband has. Now in New Jersey, for instance, dower and courtesy no longer exists. Some states still have it. But it's pretty much saying, hey, everything you own, I own. Everything I own, you own. So it was 50-50. That, that, that's what it is. Back then, when, when this existed in New Jersey, everything we had was 50-50. Right? So dower and courtesy. Husband, if you die, wife gets it. Wife, if you die, husband gets it. That's it. Right? Now, like I said, 
dower and courtesy in some states is no longer available. So the main marital residence is the only thing that's still protected under a dower and courtesy. That's, the, that's a homestead, for instance. Okay? To transfer a property that has dower and courtesy rights. And again, it goes state by state, so you need to know state law. Right? And we'll address this when we get to the, the final week is state law. But dower and courtesy, if somebody falls within these laws, then both parties must sign any documents. So let's say I acquire a property um, with my wife. We're married back in, 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 in the example here in, in Jersey before 1980. So let's say I acquire property with my wife in 1979. All right. The property that I acquired with her belongs to both. That's obvious. But what if I acquired another property by myself without her? Because I bought it before May 28, 1980, it falls under dower and courtesy. So even though it's under my name alone, the dower and courtesy says it belongs to both. So both must sign. So to a, we, if, we, if I'm trying to sell by myself, I must obtain a release of dower and courtesy from the other spouse. Okay. Guys, make sure cameras are on. Cameras, cameras, cameras. Very important. Okay. Dower and courtesy. Uh, so we'll talk about that when we get to, um, to that uh, chapter. So right now, uh, uh, Ahmed, it, it's a, 1980 is just a New Jersey thing. Some other states also have abolished dower and courtesy, right? So when I mentioned 1980, it was state specific, and we have that uh, at the end. That's your final week of this course is going to be New Jersey uh, specific. So it, it pretty much gives uh, rights to the main marital residence, no matter who owns it. That's what it is. <clears throat> now, elective share. Now, elective share not electric, electric share, okay, is elective share, is a right that a surviving spouse has. So let's say, right, let's say that I uh, decided to put um, zero dollars for the wife in the will, zero dollars, okay? So if I put zero dollars, do you think it's fair to the wife? Do you think it's fair? Because she doesn't get anything? Saying no, it's not fair. You guys don't know my wife, okay? So don't, 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 it, it's not, listen, it's very fair, okay? <laughs> of course it's not fair. She's been putting up with me for all these years. It's definitely not fair for me to say zero, right? It's not fair at all. So, <laughs> who would do something like this? That's not nice. Listen, <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of people out there, right? I put at least $1, so it's not a zero. At least you get some. Anyway, but that's what I'm trying to say here. If somebody, <laughs> if somebody puts zero dollars, every state has a different rule. In the state of New Jersey, for instance, they have the right to say, what do you mean Bruno didn't leave me anything? By law, I'm entitled to one third, at least one third of whatever his uh, uh, assets were. You guys understand? So that's an elective share where the... The surviving spouse has the right to step up and say, listen, I don't care how much you put there. I'm entitled to at least one third. Right. That's it. So elective is I'm entitled to something. And if it's in a state that still recognizes dower and courtesy, I'm entitled to one half of the estate. That's that's what it is. Uh, Lula, even if they're on the deed. So if I'm on the deed, if I'm on the deed, uh, that means we own the property together, then it'll be there immediately mine. But I'm saying something that's yours by yourself, even if, um, uh, if you put zero, I'm entitled to go claim something, right? Up to one third, and this is the example in the state of New Jersey. Again, every state has their own rules regarding elective shares. So the homestead is where we live. The, uh, um, 
Dower and courtesy is ancient rights that we had. And elective share is even if you put zero, I'm entitled to request more. Okay. All right. Next, we have leasehold estates. We already covered this. Leasehold means renters, or as we commonly know, tenants. It involves a, sh a short period of time or a definite period of time. That means you're not going to be there forever. Now, there's different types of leasehold estates. There's an estate for years. There's an estate from period to period, a state at will, and a state at sufferance. Okay. I'm going to start with this one. If you guys see, right, and I just want your, your opinion on this. If you see, we're talking about leases, we're talking about renting, okay? If you see the word estate for years, I mean the sentence estate for years, what type of lease or renting agreement is this? Do you think it's short period of time? It's long period of time? What is your feeling regarding this sentence? Estate for years. And I'll go back to my water real quick. Uh, now you're thinking I'm going to trick you. So go for years. It has to be for a short. Uh, see, that's what it is. Has to be a short period of time. All right, Ruth, uh, short period. Okay, because I, I guess you're also getting used to being tricked. <laughs> short period of time. All right, Riley says any designated amount of time. And the answer is. The answer is definite. It's not a long period of time. It's not a short period of time. It's a definite period of time. So it sucks, and that's why I focus on this one. It sucks that they don't call it a definite estate or spe specified time estate. But the key thing about estate for years is that it has a check in and a check out. So a state for years could be three days at a, at a hotel, could be one week at an Airbnb, could be six months at a residential, could be one year as a residential, could be three years at a commercial. It doesn't necessarily have to be for years. The key feature about a state for years is that it's a definite period of time. So there's a, hey, I'm coming in on this date and I'm leaving on that date. You guys understand? It's the only one that really, really sucks to explain because of the words for years. It sounds like it's for several years. Yeah, but nope, not for a short period of time. Nope, not for a long period of time either. It's just check in, check out. Entrance and exit are defined as being on this date and that date. So you guys go to a hotel right now, you go to a resort, whatever. You're going to say, hey, on, on Friday, I check in at this time, right? And then on Sunday, I check out at this time. As an example, that's an estate for years. Again, because you designate it when you're coming in and when you're leaving. That's an estate for years. Okay. I'm going to explain better in a little bit as well, but uh, Ruth, let me know on YouTube or anybody else that's on YouTube, let me know if you got it. Um, well, Lula, you're asking, what about if you stay in a hotel for a long period of time? Well, then my question is, how long? Is it indefinite? Is it indefinite or you're talking about you're going to stay there for a week, for a month, two months, right? So there are hotels that do like an extended stay, like extended stay America or something like that, right? There, there are hotels that do extended stay. My question to you is still the same. Do you have a particular date to leave? So it's a two month rental of that hotel. But do, did you define the day you're going to leave? That's, that's what defers here. If we say 
I'm going to stay here for two months. Okay, great. For two months, right? We are right now, you're going to go in on October 26th, right, of 2020. And you're going to leave on December 26th of 2020. The fact that you determined a checkout, you already said this is in the state for years. It's not how long you're going to stay there. It's the fact that we determined that you're going to leave. Right? So the next one that we have, and, and maybe we'll, we'll make a difference, is the estate from period to period. So these are the two basic estates. It's either we have a definite period of time or we have a renewable period of time, which is week to week, uh, month to month, year to year, right? Whatever way you, whatever renewal period you agree to, that's your uh, period to period. If it's in the state for years, hey, I'm coming in at this time and I'm leaving at this time or this date and leaving that date, period. That's it. Uh, I work for social services and some hotels change rooms due to change of circumstances. Uh, well, I think social services might be a little, a little different in, in definition. This is like a regular uh, lease. I'm not sure how it would be determined based on, on again, uh, government uh, assistance uh, or whatever way it might work. We're talking about regular, regular leases, but the definition of it is still the same. If there's a check-in, like Denise wrote, uh, basically have a date and time to come and go. Yes, the fact that you have, hey, I'm here today and I'm going to leave on this date. If it's predetermined that you're going to leave on that date, it's a definite period, it's a state for years. If it's a renewable period, it's called from period to period, it never ends. As long as you pay, or I guess Lula, as long as government pays, right? As long as there's a, some type of comp, uh, uh, um, renewal, right? Then it never ends. The payment is at definite intervals, everything else renews. This one, no. There's a, like Ruth just, just wrote, there's a start and there's an end. That's the key, period, okay? Then we have a state at will and a state at sufferance. And I think you guys can figure this one out, right? At will, I'm okay with you staying. At sufferance, why are you still here? That's, that's the whole change of things. At sufferance, you violated the terms of, of the agreement. At sufferance, you did not pay the rent. At sufferance, you're destroying the property. At sufferance, you're disturbing the peace, right? Not ludicrous, though. We're talking about your neighbors, right? And at will, it's okay. Your lease expired. Your lease expired. Like, it was supposed to leave a year from now. It expired. I allow you to stay there. Sure. For an indefinite period of time. At will. I got no problem. As long as you pay, keep on going. You guys understand? So, the basic... Two is for years or from period to period, and then it could be either at will or at sufferance. All right. So again, and this is just to highlight, as you guys see. By the way, I don't think I mentioned before, but whatever's in green is most likely to be or things to pay attention to, most likely to be in the exam. Whatever is in yellow. I've seen in the exam, or it's something that you should pay attention to in real life. So it's one or the other. But again, whatever's in green already highlighted, maintain focus on. So a state for years, again, there's a definite period of time with a beginning and end date. Period. That's what it is. If it's in a state for years, then it automatically terminates without require, requirement of notice. So let's imagine you're at a hotel, right? You went to on vacation and you booked until Sunday. Sunday at 11 a.m., they call you and say, hey, checkout is until 12. Do they have to call you? Is there a requirement for them to call you? The answer is no. There's no requirement. They're doing a courtesy call because it's understood by both parties, the hotel and the, the tenant, right? That by Sunday at 11, I mean, by, tw by Sunday at 12, you must be out. So I don't need to go there. 
right? I don't even need to go there and, hey, get out. I don't need to. We agreed that you're going to leave. Now, if you wanted to stay longer, could you call the hotel manager and say, hey, listen, can I rent for another day? They'll say either yes, at will, or no, and if you stay, it's called at sufferance. Make sense now? Yep, yeah? okay, cool. Uh, in a periodic estate, or period for period, it automatically renews as long as you make a timely payment of rent. That's what it is. At sufferance, like I said, you're there without consent. Landlord is suffering. We're going to talk about this more in detail. We have a chapter just for this stuff, right? But right now, it's just, again, to the first day is to give you an idea of what's out there. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? Because if not, we're going to take a break and we're going to start chapter four. We have until midnight, so... Let me know if you have any questions before I end the tonight's session. We got thumbs up over there. Great. All right, cool. So guys, if you have no questions, I hope you enjoyed your first day. I know it's a lot of info and first week is going to be a little, a little confusing, but I'll, I'll repeat so many times the same things. I'll keep on bringing back and forth. I'm going to go back and forth. So try to keep things fresh in your head. Okay. Don't forget practice quizlets. Uh, do the replays and do the, the review questions at the end of each chapter. I have all that in the student portal. If you cannot access the student portal, make sure you reach out to me so um, I can help you with that, okay? So with that being said, I'll see you tomorrow uh, in the morning if you guys want to join the morning class, which is almost over, or I'll see you tomorrow at 5.30. Thank you, guys. Have a blessed evening.